come back from that break, we are discussing about the crisis in Uganda's education sector, and we are trying to look at it, whether it's a symptomatic uh, of inherited governance deficits. So I will bring back uh, uh, Dr. Deus, uh, who joined us a little bit earlier. We have seen uh, the media has reported uh, various uh, statements from the government officials, from Ministry of Public Service and also Ministry of Education, who have directed striking teachers, especially from the arts side, to either go back to school or they lose their jobs. Is this the best way to handle such a crisis? that at some point government has to come in to manage that strike. It's normal. Uh, they will come in uh, to attempt and, and manage the strike. And one way is to threaten leaders and, and to, to, to take them through lots of challenges that they can succumb or, or fear. That's, that's one, one, one side of looking at it. And of course, the strike on, on the other side is an attempt to challenge government and so government is also trying to say that possibly you can't put us in the corner. We had a good plan and it's a, a people's plan, let's say. And so you can't push us to, to a non-people's plan, assuming that government is, is, is in charge of, 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 it, of its plans and that these plans take us uh, in a positive direction. So we have a situation of a strike and it has to be managed. But in my experience, uh, they are, this is an attempt to stress them to the point of saying, okay, let's give in uh, and, 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 and let's strike a, a deal. But um, uh, on, on the other hand, government's approach says, no, look, if you do not come back to class, we, we possibly will, will sack you. Yes, it, that is only if they are lawless. That is only if government is very serious about the laws in place that, that really manage these industrial relations. Because how can government possibly sack them? It will only be an act of lawlessness because the laws allow these people to demonstrate over uh, a concern, over an industrial concern, and a wage is one of the concerns. Discrimination is one of the concerns. And by the way, it seems government is on the wrong side because the discrimination that is being commissioned does not meet the criteria for, for, for uh, in a way that the laws provide. And, and it seems to me, in my experience, that even on the basis of the discrimination, the, the amount of money that is being uh, 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 proposed between an arts teacher and a, and a, and a science teacher, that same that gap itself is good reason for, for workers at the same rank to agitate. It's good reason in itself because it, it is not it is not justifiable. That, that gap is not justifiable by, by all means and circumstances. And also considering what Dr. Msingzi was saying and on whether the, the, the difference actually will amount some uh, wonders in science when there are no laboratories or, or other, or other uh, accessories to, 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 to what they are trying to achieve. So according to me, if government is saying we will sack you after this, then they would also be either acting lawlessly because they have signed all the documentation all with them and, and they have followed all the procedures they have uh, tried to uh, to negotiate but it seems there is no deal good deal yet and on the other side the law allows them to continue uh, uh, agitating but let, let's talk also very frankly who is at loss here? Because look, you are threatening very experienced teachers. 
you are telling very experienced teachers that we can easily replace you. I don't understand. Yes, there are so many teachers languishing around, but I thought government thought these were very experienced people. They that they have been paid and they have been uh, trained. They have been they have built experience and skill. And so, if you replace them so fast in in a moment as as a way of solving what you think is a problem, which to me is a problem being caused by bad policy, not their problem, because they feel discriminated. And unless you are saying, okay, even if you feel discriminated, go, go back to work, you have no choice. But the laws give them some choice. If you lose all this experience, who is at loss? The children of this country, and it happens to be the poor children of this country the children from very poor families. And so citizens, I thought the members of parliament would take this seriously because they are the ones representing the poorest in our society. And they are there seated at parliament, commissioning budgets without questioning them. And the possibility that you will undermine the same people they pretend to represent. And maybe this is a calling on the people. That is if they can hear us because they is the right services don't reach them uh, the people should question because whatever is happening parliament commission leaders they should have questioned look your excellency this is going to bring problems to our people this is going to undermine the education of the real people we represent in this parliament those who vote us and so the threats to me are another difficult, challenging, it's a management tool, it's a society management tool. People are late, they are not managed. <laughs> they are just trying to manage, it's all anxiety, it's all distortion, no salary scales that are possibly justifiable, from parastato to public service to professors to non-professors, it's to recover you. And I think it helps politics because it keeps us rambling. It keeps us all oh, debating and arranging meetings, uh, talk shops, it is it. It is not helping us to move society forward. And so, yes, the, 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 the teachers have all the laws on their side. Government seems not to have, it are only have threats. It can only break the law. The only possible good thing is to sit with these teachers and address this agitation. Because even if you don't, even if you, I mean, I, I pity those who force a teacher. You, you can force me to class, mm, I don't know. But if I decide to take the strike to my heart, the whole society is at loss. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Deus. I wonder would bring Dr. Musinguzi. You have just heard from your fellow doctor and your good friend. <laughs> if, if 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 government really takes this decision of sucking teachers, does it have time, financial resources, and other capacity to recruit and orient new teachers in a, in such a short span? Yes, as uh, Dr. Mwezi has said, I mean, even uh, even if you suck and you want to replace them, are they easily replaceable? Yes, there could be people having a bachelor's in education and you think they can do the same work. But someone who has been teaching for the last five years, for the last 10 years, they have authored the books, they have, they are not, they are not just that easily replaceable. As we are going through this, uh, one of the listeners reminded me, you know, back 19, uh, early 1980s, when these people went to the bush, uh, along the way, they gave us a 10-point program as, as, as their ideology, as their mandate when they get into government. And you realize that out of those 10-point programs, there is no point on education. Never they did talk about education, even when I imagine from the bush. Now one might begin wondering, give them the benefit of doubt that they forgot do we take them but by what they wrote that they never prioritized education right from the beginning? Education doesn't seem to be the priority of, 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 of this government. 
And yes, they are going to threaten to sack these people. But if you know that the quality of education determines the quality of the population, it is the bedrock for the economy, then you would want to address education more sensitively and more responsibly and, and, and in a more caring way. Now, the moment you begin issuing threats, then it, we will begin to say, okay, you have the coercive powers and you have the legitimacy to utilize them. But uh, as Dr. Davis mentioned, you also put in place laws that allow, you know, the people to form trade unions and also agitate for their rights. Then we see the contradictions. And, and, and for me, these contradictions even worry me more than the government's ability to replace. They may not have the resources. They say, we are going to compensate you. And they take five, ten years without compensating. They will run adverts. They will get some teachers. Yes, to put in these schools. But the main question will be, what is the quality of education that we are promoting? How much do we care about education? What value do we place? You know, against these... Uh, people who have educated literally everybody. And as we say, you know, before you become a scientist, you go through primary school, you study social sciences, you study literacy. You understand? You go to a secondary school, you study history alongside, the, uh, alongside the chemistry uh, until you reach a moment where you are specializing. Now, you are saying you want to suck and replace. Are you thinking about education? Are you thinking about uh, the future of the country? As I said from the beginning, it, you're saying I am powerful. I can force you to do uh, what I want you to do. I can even go against the laws and, uh, and, and then sack you. I, I may not, but you tell me they say they are going to sack you. Even you don't think they are going to give you terminal, terminal benefits if they are to do it. Eh? So in a dictatorial government, Yes, it is possible they can sack you. And it is possible within one month or two months, they may have new teachers placed in schools. But if you are the new teacher being recruited and you are replacing the teachers who were agitating for their rights, it means that kind of argument reduces education to a matter of survival. It's just survival. You say, you, you, you guys, we've been paying you however little it is if you are not happy with it. You go, we can get those who are happy with it. After all, they are starving. The economy is bad. Eh? They will go with it. And, and, and for me, that debases eh? the value of education. It, 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 it vulgarizes what education is and what it is for. So knowing that it is the teachers, whether arts or sciences, who have you know, produced the professionals, who have produced the leaders that we have. You know, people have been asking, he certainly did not study sciences, as he only led this country for 40, for 36 years now. He has been competing with the messenger, who is a medical doctor. If he values sciences, why didn't he say, okay, I've led the country for 20 years, let me allow the scientists eh, to come in and break this economy. His deputy president is not a scientist. The prime minister is not a scientist. So again, when you put this hype about sciences, you, you are treating, as they said, society, as, as if it is, you know, an abstract thing that is out there, you can kick up and kick down and kick across without providing the required leadership and moving in the right direction. So, and I said, and Dr. Mwese reinforced it, this level of ad hocism, you know, we are doing things in an ad hoc way. The level of ad hocism, it, it, it is dangerous. It is dangerous for the country. So uh, about the, uh, the dynamics of whether they can expel them and whether they can, well, they may not do it because of, uh, of the limitation, but when the dictator is pushed to the end, they can do it. Say, you know what? Don't joke with us. Eh? We fought. We can still fight you. And, and you know that has been the language. We fought, we defeated many wars and many enemies. But are we prioritizing education? You know, that for me, that is the most important consideration out there. Thank you, Dr. 
Musinguzi. Now I want to bring back Dr. Dewos. I remember, I recall very well, you were once the chairperson of Makere University Academic Staff Association, and you had the same problem of having loggerheads between government and the academic staff from Makere University concerning salary enhancement. How did you reach into understanding with government, and what lessons can you not to right now learn from how you guys manage to solve these issues, government? Because I, there were also threats of uh, those ones who don't want to teach, which can replace them. How did you manage, and what lessons can you not to learn from how you manage when you're a chairperson of MUAS? Plus, by the way, and for us, they are, they are, you know, when we were agitating for a fair wage, everyone looked at us as lunatics. We have been struggling for a fair wage since 1989, since uh, uh, Professor Joko and friends who are now elders in, in this society. Uh, pushed NRA then NRM to, to, to start, uh, you know, inviting academia on the cake sharing uh, table. Uh, and because, you know, we had gone uh, capitalism and uh, we, uh, Professor Juko then and friends were reacting to liberalization uh, because earlier we had thought government would uh, harmoniously, uh, socially, like they had stood for. Um, improve all sectors of our, of our uh, economy in a way that would even you know, deal with these possible agitations that have come with capitalism. So those years, we started, and everyone thought we were crazy. But to say the fail to understand that we couldn't possibly, as teachers, teachers have really compensated themselves for by moonlighting, going around universities, by being both secondary and university teachers, by selling scripts, by selling marks. <laughs> because if you are managing, you commission are managing a budget in government, you probably can decide to undermine service delivery and, and pocket all the money with your, with your uh, staff in the department. But for us, what would we have done? Cheat? That would be intellectual dishonesty. And I think we see our bar is a bit higher. And so we opted for proper methods of, of lawful methods of agitating. And we've come a long way. So around the uh, early 2000, mid 2000 there, the president started the policy of giving more money to, to scientists and, uh, and saying that you see scientists do more, they need more, 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 uh, more, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more, more money so they can concentrate on their work because they are leaving the country. First of all, he began yes, by responding and increasing our wages slowly, slowly, but after agitation after agitation, it was not smooth also. But again, later say, no, scientists are doing more, let me, since you, the artists, are teaching a lot of students and generating money, let the scientists get some, some, more, some, more, some more money on the payroll. Mm -hmm. And that started. And for us as, as leaders and as staff, we felt, okay, let's, let's honor the president. The president has a view. Let's keep uh, working with it. But we categorically disagree with him that we do the same work. But for the sake of harmony and, and for the sake of allowing uh, a presidential idea, maybe we felt at that time it was part of uh, the ideological complex of uh, leadership uh, that stems from leadership, uh, and we we said it's fine, and and so we got the first divisions between science and but it was a small wage difference, not big. Let's say three hundred thousand between an assistant lecturer who is arts and, and an assistant lecturer who is science. But later, uh, last 2020, we got a, a public service and the team decided to pay.
because they had some money, one million the drunk. Now, the president and the team decided to pay professors and associate professors and vice chancellors the highest wage promised and left the rest behind. So the difference between an associate professor now and a senior lecturer is about five million shillings. And that also is a problem. I left it on the table. It's a problem of, uh, of staff. And, and we were negotiating out of it. And we had a, a strike, I think, last year. And uh, we were also threatened, DTC, who, who act like, uh, I don't know, they have been sent. Uh, and they, they don't cooperate. They, they don't care. And so we, we, we sort of like uh, relaxed a bit, but with, with, with a tough call on them that this would undermine uh, education. And we may be quiet, but this will not go down well with, with, with the university education. So we are talking about about 2,700 staff who are affected by this policy, only looking at 350 staff, paying them a full wage, 15 million, 14 million, and then the rest being left uh, behind in the prolactor system. So this began with us. Now, all of a sudden, we, we had talk with arts and science uh, in the mainstream, uh, including, by the way, workers who are science, uh, public service workers who are science, and those who are arts. It is not only going to affect teachers, but also workers in public service who are arts and science. Those who are being taken for work. Already, for example, some, some workers in some ministries are already earning uh, very high wages. Uh, and also some specialized schools like in aviation, the people there are really earning very good wages. So this talk came. But to me, I understand it. Let me go back to I understand it in, in, in two ways. One, I've been attempting so hard to, to understand the ideological uh, view of, of the NRM government in this science art thing. But I feel to, to align myself with the possibility that increasing a wage only without working on infrastructure and all the other things would actually achieve the real aim of moving society forward, as opposed to just holding people, maybe they need money, so give them and they keep quiet. Versus uh, the possibility that this is a totally divide and rule issue to, to keep airlines rambling on non-issues. On, on non -issues. And, and, and of course, of course, leading to a, a total uh, misprogramming of society. And I'm beginning to think this is a, a total misprogramming of society. It, it is, it's more of a, a, a salaries and are more of a management tool, political management tool, as opposed to leadership tool. Because if it's a leadership tool, then a wage will go with a facilitation of those teaching science. And it would be, it wouldn't be unjustifiable really four million between people of the same rank is unjustifiable <laughs> and in a country where everyone is virtually trying to survive is unjustifiable and, and it can only affect I, I had yesterday the, the government spokesperson who is to me qualifies as a very careless lot of very disastrous generation uh, laughing that maybe acts he just that they are feeling nugu. And I, I just couldn't imagine the level of idiocy. We, we are dealing with a very serious matter at a very critical time in, in our evolution. And you see these very qualified social scientists vulgarizing and trivializing to the very least instead of guiding and helping. And then you ask yourself, why did we even go to school? Idiots. And you ask yourself, what's wrong with society? This is a time when probably all of us would be saying, no, wait a minute. Let's organize this way. Let's do this. Let's 
come to the table and organize because the, the gaps, the, this way of, of, of incentivizing and motivating people for a job, a society job, is clearly inappropriate. And for an adult senior member, senior in age, I don't think in, in terms of organizing, the experience of organizing society, to trivialize this at a level of government is very really disheartening on my side. And so, yes, in my experience, this has happened to us, but I, I can also say in my experience, it's counterproductive. It begins to, to, to push us to, to coil, to also act like any heathen. I had the first lady say, you, you are ungodly. Oh my God, everyone in government seems very ungodly. And, and I'm, <laughs> I'm beginning to wonder whether this word God, patriotism, really is sincere. I think we would rather all be ungodly and do the ungodly things. And then maybe we'll have a conference of the ungodly and agree on how to behave appropriately in un ungodly ways. But this business of godly and godly patriotism and patriotism, <laughs> It used to be an act of anxiety, survival, wishing to live for a day, and to see adults, like a government spokesperson, you know, saying artists have no go over, to be so trivial is very disheartening. And, and it, it undermines everything I know that is logical. It sets me into the mood of survival, and also a desire maybe to behave like the heathen, and also start misguiding society where I have an opportunity. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Deos. We have spent most of our time. So I would like uh, to give each of you three, three minutes uh, as we conclude and share with us what you think is the most permissible win-win scenario for teachers and the government to salvage this education sector. I'll start with you, Dr. Dennis. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Abel. Yeah, the government thinks they can do things in the way they want. Fortunately, the population has said no. We know that there is a right way and a good way and the best way of doing things. So instead of, uh, you know, these contradictory statements in the place, which, which are not clear, instead of the threats, I think the most reasonable and noble thing to do is to recognize there is a problem and then uh, collectively look for sustainable sustainable solutions. Now, we, we need to go beyond sectoral negotiation. Today it's Makerere, tomorrow it is uh, teachers, the other day it is Boda Boda, the other day it is what? We, we need to have a uniform way of, of dealing with the agitation across the board. Uh, whether this is going to come uh, so quickly, it, it, is, it is a different issue. Because as my colleague, Dr. Wes, has noted, this is a political management tool. When, when we studied history, they say the French used assimilation, the British used divide and rule. And, 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 and they are clearly dividing the fraternity of uh, trade unions, especially in particular teachers' unions. They want it shattered so that it does not have the capacity to negotiate. And unfortunately, we are also fluctuating the teaching force. We are dividing students and uh, we are fluctuating the education system and, and, and things cannot work like that. So getting out of this, we need to see the Ministry of Public Service, you know, taking charge and taking responsibility. Work with other sectors and, and, and then work out an approach that is going to deal and address all these issues, eh? you know, working with the other respective bodies of government. The threats, the what, are clearly misplaced. They, they, they are making an ugly situation, even look uglier. You read the statements and you are not sure whether these are authored by the people that you, you would normally regard with high esteem. No, we cannot, we cannot continue moving like this. Eh? Something must change. Um, thank you, Abia. Thank you so much, Dr. Musim Guzid. Dennis, uh, Dr. Deus. 
what is your say and what can government and teachers do to salvage this crisis? You see, when the NRM, NRA came into force, uh, and I was a child, a very, a very keen child, and I, I have followed all my life. It's very surprising. I have followed all my life this um, the regime, not only as, a, as a, an interested party, but from the House, uh, because I saw agitations in the House to get this peaceful end to, to, to our problems. I saw it real in the house. And so I followed clearly. And, and I think part of what brought in was to, to allow the population at that time, which seemed uh, frigid, to, to discuss uh, destiny uh, together without any kind of form of... of uh, disorientation. Because at that time, the NRM promised a fundamental change. Now, many years uh, down the line, for some reasons, and in my middle ages, I begin to see things that to me seem like those that I felt when I was young. I'm just trying to, to think then government needs to recall what it promised the people. And at some point, the president used to compare South Korea with resource-rich countries and pointed to a view that when people are empowered, when people are skilled, when people have all the capacity, they can do more what natural resources can't do. I don't know where, where that got lost at some point. And possibly, what I see the president do now cannot possibly tie with what were his aspirations then. It cannot build a society or a people that are empowered, that have a clear vision on what they can do as a people to push a country in a way that natural resources can't do. And so at this point, I want the NRM government to go back to its core, to harmonize people, to allow that people can sit together and logically chat a way forward together without any form of, of, of disorientation, with minimal disorientation, with minimal ambiguity. And so my call, with all my experience, is for the striking teachers and government as they have always done, to call these teachers, sit on the table and see this ambiguity that has, extreme ambiguity that has been created of a very huge gap. And I'm talking about also lecturers in university, public universities. They are, they are, they are stand on this everything. Labor owns everything. And I want laborers of all kind to know if you care to tell anyone, whether you are laboring on the fields, whether you are laboring in a tax park, whether you are laboring in a school or a university, I want people to know that labor owns everything. And the area we get to know that labor owns everything in a peripheral country the better. The, the area we get to know that, the better. And so, to me, this agitation is normal. It is reacting to a situation that is abnormal. And let government and the people affected sit on the table and agree on how we can move forward. And that's the only way forward. There is no complexity. The teachers know what they want and government knows what is being done and knows even what is supposed to be done. Let them sit and agree on how to move forward. And once again, labor owns everything. The area we get to know that, the better. There is no other. Labor owns everything. I thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Deus Kamunyu and Dr. Musinguzi Dennis for accepting our invitation to participate uh, on ACFIM Talks. I want to thank people outside there who have been following. You can still follow this show. You can still rewatch this show on our ACFIM YouTube channel. That is ACFIM Uganda. Thank you so much. We shall meet again next week as we discuss issues on governance and money in politics. From me to you, it has been me, Abel Etheru. Thank you so much. Meet you next week on Friday.